Hello everyone on this Wednesday, September 16th. I'm your host, Connor Northup. This is the 10th episode of the Deep Bar MMA Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host for the first time in three weeks, Lucas Grandsire. Hey, welcome back to the States, Lucas. <laughs> Thank you. Feels good to be back. Got to work on my American accent, make sure I say words like yeah and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> I'm getting, getting used to it. And uh, we're also welcoming uh, our guest this week. Kind of to join us, MMA Fighting's own Alex Kaylee. How are you doing, Alex? I am great. It's great to see you. Uh, it's my first time uh, doing a show with Connor. Lucas and I have done have done shows together before. Lucas, you were looking like a young uh, Mark McGrath from uh, Sugar <laughs> Ray. You look fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, now that you say that, I will change this. I actually went to a Sugar Ray concert a couple of years ago. And one thing I thought was so funny was, I mean, obviously most people were like young and everything. And I remember McGrath said, he goes, uh, and they were, I forget it was, I think it was uh, uh, Fly. And he was like, this song, he's like, was like, like number one hit in America. And all the kids are screaming. And he goes, and none of you were born yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 1999 or something like her, 98 or 99. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, it's something crazy. He's like, none of you were born yet. Everyone just started cheering. Oh, uh, guys, we're dating ourselves. We're dating ourselves here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Billie Eilish. Boy, that Billie Eilish is really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, what, what a weekend this past weekend. We obviously had the two Bellator cards. Uh, Michelle Waterson and Angel Hill obviously did their thing in, in that main event. Uh, very entertaining. Uh, plus, there was a 1FC card kind of thrown in there, too. So uh, a lot to process this week. Uh, was it not, Alex? Yeah, it, uh, the two Bellator shows kind of crept up on me. I remember as I was kind of doing preparation at the beginning of the week, I'm like, oh, right. That's like, I was like, because I was, I was oddly looking forward to Musashi Davis and, of course, looking forward to the Bantamweight title fight. And it only occurred to me, I think, like on Monday or the weekend before, I was like, oh, that's those are both happening right now. One's a Friday, one's a Saturday. Uh, among among a bunch of other notable things, some debuts for Bellator, uh, some, you know, fights between high ranking guys that could lead tell shots. Uh, and then, of course, going head to head with the UFC on Saturday. So it was, yeah, it was a super busy weekend. Uh, and, uh, there was a lot of positives to take away from it. I know we're going to talk about it on the show, but I'll say I think there's a lot of good stuff for uh, for, for fans of both promotions and MMA in general. So uh, some great highlights and some some great lowlights as well. I think we'll also talk about. Yeah, no, it's been like crazy too because if you actually think about like when this whole like COVID thing had started, it was like I felt like everything was going like so slow, and now we're having like all these different cards like all the time now and everything. It was like you thought like contender series, you're like oh that feels like for like forever away. Then now, like, we're far into that. And then it was like, oh, well, you know, the Adesanya and Costa, and, like, we're only a couple of weeks away from that. So it's like, I mean, at the pace we're going now, it's just moving so fast. And then, uh, Lucas, for you, were you able to catch, like, a lot, a lot of the action this past weekend now that you're on kind of a, a normal schedule with, you know, when the fights are, they're not, like, you know, early in the morning? Yeah, I mean, when you're in France, you got to pick and choose now. It's just, like, luckily they're on at a, a sort of reasonable time. But, yeah, Bellator, I mean, it – it, it was something like, you know, at first thought it was the same fight cards. It's like, wow, Bellator is stacked. And then they would bait and switched me by, you know, switching them. And I was like, ah, okay, so they're both kind of medium. But uh, no, it was fun to watch Bellator again, even though I had to stream it because Paramount isn't on everything. But luckily, they're done with Paramount. And then, you know, UFC was decent too. So, uh, but it, it, there's a lot of MMA. I mean, you even mentioned one championship. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and pretend like I watched that one. But uh, yeah, there's so much, so much going on. It was this tough to try and catch everything. Yeah, and we're seeing like those regional promotions too. Like CFFC already had two cards, and they're having another on you know Friday or well, Thursday and Friday. So uh, the the wheels are definitely moving in the MMA world. And uh, for people that maybe are just you know watching for the first time, or even if you have been here, I'm just going to explain the kind of the theme of the show. It's MMA reporters kind of talking to MMA reporters. Uh, we'll have a little discussion with Alex kind of about the the crazy world of MMA reporting, and then we'll kind of dive in to some hot topics uh, later on, but. Uh, Alex, just like looking at uh, what you have done so far and everything too, and I saw you studied uh, sports journalism mm -hmm. at Centennial College in Toronto. Was it like yeah. MMA uh, journalism, was it, was that always the path for you? Were there other sports that maybe like you got into sports journalism uh, to begin with? Was MMA always that, that, that route? I think professionally speaking, actually, surprisingly, yes. Uh, I, I'm not maybe not when I was younger, growing up. I think like a lot of uh, you know sports fans, you, you focus on one of the big four, right? Or or uh, or again, if you're one of those cultured people, like like Lucas, I'm sure is uh, uh, you know fo fo football. You know, you watch, you study, you study the football, the the beautiful game. Uh, but a lot of us, you know, again, I'm big for North American sports. For me, basketball, I'm still a huge fan to this day. Um, but at some point, you kind of look at the, you know, you look at the field of of how it, how it is to get in there. Uh, and I'm not saying it's easy to get into MMA, by the way, but it is, you know, it's a it's a much younger sport uh, relative to, you know, NFL, MLB, exactly, you know, all the major sports that we we all know so, know so well. Uh, so so the field is definitely a bit more inviting. You know, I'll say maybe, maybe that's that's the word to use, you know. Um, it's just so young. It's so undefined 
as far as what MMA media is, I'm sure a lot of viewers and readers know that. Like you, you go to one site that has this kind of tone, you go to another site that has a completely different tone. And I mean like dramatically, I mean dramatically different tones. And that's what's cool is like there's kind of a, 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 always a place for every kind of voice right now. Will it be that way in 50 years? I, I hope so. You know, I hope that, that's just, that this is kind of, uh, how MMA is like it's just the kind of sport that invites this, these kinds of attitudes and things, but uh, maybe it won't be. Maybe it'll become more rigid and more uh, more formal. I don't know. You know, there's no way to know. But yeah, for me, uh, I loved MMA very much a late bloomer getting into the UFC and then you know from there learning about all the other promotions and going back through yeah. history. Uh, but yeah, and then just fell right into it and uh, forced very very lucky to sort of the path that came along. Just a lot of just companies that were looking for an MMA guy and I kept falling into those spots. Uh, and then yeah, eventually ending up with MMA fighting, which has been a really really great experience for the last few years. Yeah. So, Alex, uh, I think you knew this question was coming, but at what point did you realize you wanted to be the Stephen A. Smith of uh, MMA? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you, Luke? Well, you know, I'm good. You, I'm glad you got it. You, we're not mentioning that name again. We're not. We're, that's <laughs> it. To, that's it. Just, yeah, you just had to. You have to say it once, like you know. That's <laughs> once. We will also mention uh, Hamza Shemaev. That doesn't count, but we will bring him up sometime during the show. That's also a, <laughs> it's in my contract. Any show I go right. to, I have to mention uh, Hamza Shemaev. He equals ratings. So, uh, as soon as I mention his name, viewers just start pouring in. Some I don't know how they know. <laughs> It's like a dog whistle. Like a, I don't know how it works, but um, uh, no, I am the nicest person in the MMA media. Uh, in a, in a, in a, in, by the way, in a, in a, in a field that has many, many nice, wonderful people, I think I am the mo- nicest person. I have a little bit of an edge. If you cross me, Lucas, you've, you've, you've been on the receiving end of it before. Uh, but, uh, and, but otherwise, I, I think, uh, no, I'm, I'm not the SAS. That's as far as I'll go as name of the <laughs> MMA sports world. <laughs> And uh, for you too, Alex, uh, like when you're oh, talking about... I think, oh, sorry, guys. I think I was, uh, that was on my end. Thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, like when you were talking about too, like uh, how, you know, it was kind of inviting MMA too, like what was kind of like your journey into that? Like how did you kind of, you know, work your way up to, to where you are now? Oh, I'm, I'm one of those uh, pro wrestling converts, you know, I'm the, uh, I'm the, uh, I had an older brother who like hated, who hated uh, MMA, hated the UFC. Uh, he didn't like he doesn't like uh, wrestling and like ground and pound like that kind of thing. He, he was I think he got into that sort of uh, unfortunate period where I don't want to say unfortunate, but like a period where like Tito Ortiz was kind of the champion. So you saw a lot of that. You saw a lot of the Tito style, take a guy down, beat him up, which he didn't find particularly interesting. He's more of a traditional martial artist. He likes Kung Fu and Taekwondo, things like that. So so the UFC wrestling grappling, not not a bit huge fan of it, but. So that kind of, I didn't even try it for a while. Just, I just was like, oh, my brother knows who he's talking about. Then, so, then someone said Brock Lesnar came as, as fighting. And I'm like, I got to see this bull crap. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I did like a very little bit of research. I'm like, he's fighting a former, like you know, Frank Mir. I'm like, he's fighting a former champion. Like, is this a good idea? Like, like I know Brock Lesnar's tough. And I know about the D1 wrestling background. But anyway, yeah. And then uh, I saw that. And uh, I can't remember who else on that show. But later, uh, after that, I think GSP and Anderson Silva, that great boom period, I think, for a lot of people getting into the sport. You know, Chuck Liddell was still in there mixing it up, Rampage Jackson, John Jones coming up. It was such a great time to become a fan. Um, so that's kind of how my opinions are formed. I'm definitely of that newer school, uh, not an old school like Pride guy. Again, I've done my research, but I wasn't in the moment. So, yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a mid-aughts, I'm a mid-aughts uh, convert, as it were, yeah. by pro wrestling style. Yeah, no, that was definitely like unique time too. Because I think I started getting around. It was around that like 2009, like 2010 range too, where I like I saw guys like Chuck Liddell too. I mean, I think he was starting. He was kind of out outside that that prime too. Like a, like a, like I think of like Rich Franklin, Couture. All those guys were kind of I guess you know kind of one foot out the door at the time. But uh, yeah, I mean that that was a, a crazy time. Yeah, like Nogara, Nogara was a uh, big knock. Obviously, little Nog just retired yeah. too, but yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting time for sure. And you learn so much when you get into a sport for the first time. I'm also a late bloomer when it comes to basketball. Like I said, I'm a hardcore basketball fan, but like I think a lot of, I was as a kid, I watched like Michael Jordan. That's about it. And then as I got older, and you know, like, Toronto kind of got a more established team, and I was like, oh, it was perfect time for me to come in. And then you learn all this stuff right away, and you have stupid opinions early on that hopefully you get rid of. Some of them never change. Uh, I used to think Chris Lieben was like the greatest fighter I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> I thought Chris Lieben was brilliant. I think his fight with the Sakara was one of the first fights I'd seen. It's one of those classic Lieben things where he just got punched a million times and just walked right through. And I'm like, this guy will never lose. I'm like, this guy's amazing. Look at him. He gets, he's, <laughs> he's invincible. Uh, I learned very quickly Chris Lieben was not invincible uh, and a lot of other things, thankfully, that have allowed me to, to work in this field. <laughs> <laughs> And for you too, just like being in the Canada area too, like were you, uh, how familiar were you, with, like especially like when you're getting started too, were you familiar with like the regional scene there? No, not at all. And and if anything, it was kind of like the that that was the bad thing was I thought it was so cool with GSP and you know TK over in Montreal and like and so I thought the scene was booming and I think it was for like a minute, and then and then you know when the uh, Ontario when they passed like they're gonna all MMA I'm like oh this is great this is the second wave of, of Canadian MMA is gonna come along and like the exact opposite happened there's too much regulation too much red tape 
I, I'm just not sure what happened to, to MMA in, uh, in Ontario, but it's pretty much, it's a very dead scene outside of the, the amateur uh, circuit. So uh, in that sense, I came in at the wrong time. And I'm a little sad about that. I would have loved to have been able to cover more local events, but really there just aren't any. Yeah. And did you start to like as more as like a, like a, like a radio guy, like kind of doing like stuff like this or were you more like kind of print? Oh, blogger. Uh, so my, <laughs> I will. So my my start was with doing uh, stuff on Bloody Elbow. They, they have a very lively fan post section. I'm not sure how much it is now. I know at the time when I started doing, it, I'm like, yeah, it was very accessible. People seemed to read it if you wrote something that was compelling, which was good, very uh, merit based. Mm -hmm. And I just I was just doing Ultimate Fighter recaps. I just love the Ultimate Fighter. I noticed st sites stopped doing it, and then when I started doing the recaps myself, I realized why, because uh, <laughs> the seasons were getting pretty bad. But for me, it was so fresh just to write about it. So I was able to you know uh, come up with something at least moderately interesting. And you'd get like six comments on there, and every Every time you got like six, like six comments for me, it was like, oh, this is amazing. This is the greatest <laughs> feeling in the world. That, that six comments might equal like 12 people who actually read it and then half of them comments. I don't know. But um, yeah, I started, uh, started uh, with writing and kind of wanted to get into video, get into broadcasting. But uh, again, that's a little bit more difficult to get into. Again, but I love doing stuff like this. And, you know, uh, so I like having the option of, of doing podcasts and videos, but also, uh, but primarily writing. And I'm, and I'm fine with that. I enjoy writing as well. Yeah. What's been that like too? Like, like you say, you like doing stuff like this, and obviously you're doing more of that now too. Like, what has that been like? Kind of adjusting to that you know, throughout the years. Uh, well, I I've always liked to talk, but I think like a lot of fans, it's one thing to know that you can talk about a sport, and another another thing to be able to do it professionally. I think that's something like I really everybody learns. I I would point to like Dominic Cruz for example. I think Dominic Cruz is a genius as an analyst. Um, and I think people who will watch him, his first couple of shows, I think people loved him right away. I remember I was very critical. I'm pretty critical of, of commentators and broadcasters. Uh, but I, I know a lot of people liked him right away. But if you watch his like first few shows to now, he's so much better. He still has a lot of improving to do, and I'm sure he'll admit that as well. But he's so much better because it's it's just a different thing to talk about a sport with like friends, uh, you know, in a private setting, and then actually do it in something like this, having 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 conversations and, and covering mm -hmm. topics and, uh, you know, knowing how to be succinct, which I'm not being right now, but uh, again... <laughs> It's it, it's certainly a work in progress. So um, yeah, I still love doing this stuff, and uh, yeah, just always always learning. It's it's tricky. It's it's definitely you have to be careful what you say, and uh, also just not be embarrassed when you say something stupid because it's going to happen. So here's something I'm curious about. You mentioned going to school for sports journalism and stuff. Mm -hmm. Your former colleague Luke Thomas always has very big comments, right? Going to sports journalism for doing MMA media. Did you feel like it was helpful going to school for that, or uh, did oh. you feel like what, what was kind of that impact? Oh, for me, hundred percent. Hundred uh, percent. It was a very, it was like a very short program, but very hands-on. Uh, classic. You know, it's a very cliche. I think for people who go back to school, uh, it you you get out of it what you put into it, right? And and it was very true in this case. So, I needed it. I needed. It. There was there was a, a lot of things which I thought I understood in theory, but then once put into practice, I realized how little I knew. And again, still to this day, still like I said, uh, there's things I'll approach and I think I know how to do it, and then you try and you're like, holy crap. I need to talk to people. I need to ask questions. Um, so yeah, it was it was hugely hugely beneficial. I would recommend to anyone who's kind of wanting to get into uh, into this field, please try some form of journalism, sports journalism. If you have a program that you can go to work, that works for you, great. But of course, just ge journalism in general is really helpful. Um, I'm not saying you can't get into it, get into it just by doing like bl blogging and tr self training. There's certainly people in the world gifted enough to do that. I am not one of them. Uh, and if you're not one of them either, I would say give give school a shot if you if you can afford it and if you have the time for it because it's it was absolutely invaluable. I wanted to ask about that too because I I went to journalism school at, at Temple, but just like when you were like looking at schools too, like uh like were a lot of schools like offer that sports journalism program because I think Penn State has that, but I don't remember like a lot of other schools kind of offering that you know hyper kind of you know sports journalism class. Uh, in Toronto, surprisingly, there's actually a few. A few good ones too. There was uh, there was three, and I think I went to like, I went to one of the smaller schools, but we have one I think at Ryerson. I think they have a dedicated sports uh, journalism program as well, and uh, uh, there's one another one closer to downtown Toronto. I was more uh, on the outskirts. I wasn't quite in downtown Toronto. So it's in, in the Greater Toronto. It's, it's it actually is uh, quite a thing to to go to sports journalism. So we and we do have a lot of uh, journalists come out of Toronto. So I mean it's not a coincidence. A lot, a lot of talent comes out of Toronto that ends up working for again big uh, huge outlets like ESPN, uh, TNT stuff like that. So yeah, it's not a coincidence. Uh, big big focus on in this area and uh, and the talent comes that shows. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any like MMA like kind of enthusiasts like as far as like professors and like other students too? Because I remember like when I was going to school too, there was like nobody. Like you said, it was like kind of like those top four sports that everyone was kind of going after. 
No, my professor hated MMA. Hated, <laughs> he's an old school, I think, boxing guy. Though even that he doesn't love, and he loves pro, and pro wrestling. So on that at least we kind of bonded. So I tried to convince him, let me do MMA projects. Uh, not that he didn't know what MMA was, he knows what it is. He just did did not like it. Uh, so that was fine. But uh, again, he you know he didn't stop me from pursuing yeah. MMA. He just uh, wasn't exactly didn't have a lot of notes for me when I came to him with MMA related questions. Let's let's put it that way. Um, but the person who really uh, the first job I I went to at the score. Uh, they were looking for people for NBA, NFL, and uh, baseball, I think. And then just offhandedly, I mentioned, oh, I would say my second like sport that I'm, uh, you know, most knowledgeable about would be MMA. And then he that suddenly moved me to the top of this hiring list because he's like, oh, great, we're looking for an MMA person. So, uh, so that's my other thing I would tell people is, guys, mention all your skills. Uh, don't be shy. Mention your skills. Don't be embarrassed by anything. If you love, I don't know, if you love cricket or something, and it doesn't come, <laughs> mention it. Throw it in. Then maybe they need a cricket person, rugby. You know, uh, it's you just never know where that opportunity is going to come along. Because again, for me, I thought maybe I'd have a shot at uh, covering basketball, and maybe I will someday. But I right now the MMA thing came up and it's just fit perfectly so i, I love covering mma uh, and i love like i said Kenny will do stuff like this yeah are you a fan of uh cricket lucas or a uh, huge fan number, number one <laughs> cricket guy right here ismail malamedov a favorite player of cricket uh, yeah uh, everything's off top of the dome just making shit up what a pull what a pull <laughs> for, for, for people uh, right that. <laughs> i mean if you're confident about it people will be like man ismail yeah this is a great great player you got lots of <laughs> home runs or touchdowns or whatever those people do no. <laughs> Cr cricket's not in the real wheelhouse it's you know basketball uh, the beautiful game and of course uh mma so here we go for sure i there was a i think a netflix documentary that was about cricket i actually want to watch it because I, I heard a lot of good things i don't know if you why? guys like saw that or not if it's cricket why would you want to watch that well oh, look it's whoa talk about like no <laughs> whoa. we, wa we watch <laughs> face punching we get paid to cover face punching you guys want to watch stuff about cricket Oh no! Disappointed, guys. Disappointed. <laughs> I have to. But please go on. So, a riveting documentary on on cricket and the hardships <laughs> of running back and forth with a weird flat bat. I remember we actually like they used to have us play that like in gym class. I remember. I always thought that was like really interesting. I was like, can we just play baseball? Like at this point, like... <laughs> just the <a> Merc. <laughs> but um. Uh, I, I guess, like, moving on to, I guess we'll go on to the debate portion of the show. And like I kind of mentioned at, at the top, uh, you know, a lot a lot to process from this past weekend. And I thought one thing that really stood out, and it kind of took place right before everything kind of happened. On Friday afternoon, Bellator obviously announced the uh, deal with CBS Sports and that they're going to be uh, moving away from Paramount Network. I believe it starts on October 1st. But uh, for you guys, too, and, like, uh, we'll start with Alex on this one, but just like how significant do you think that deal is for, for that promotion? Those were the last, so those were the last Paramount shows, right? Paramount and DAZN shows, I guess? I yeah, so. because the October 1st, they're going to start. And I think that is that the uh, October 1st, I think that's the Milan. Milan, card. yes. Uh, End of an era, end of an era, guys. No more endless uh, bar rescue commercials, ink wars. <laughs> yeah. uh, they had that. I mean, obviously, before all the stuff happened, of course, with the with the recent social unrest, they had the, they had one of the best lead-ins with cops, and I think they had cops after, which I think was big yeah. for ratings. Yeah. Like, you can't have a better lead-in than cops, and you can't lead into a better show than cops. So, 100%. unfortunately, that that is all over now. Um, it's I, I think for from a branding perspective, obviously, it's much better. I think there's so many people who didn't even know for the longest time, like why was it on Paramount Network? They didn't maybe they didn't know it used to be Spike TV. It just doesn't sound like something that would show sports. And I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Beltor was their last live uh, sports program they even had on there. So it was it was very much alone uh, in, in the Paramount Network uh, family. And while in some ways that can be beneficial, I think in this in this case it hurt. I think it made it look a little second rate. Um, if that's uh, to use a strong term, I think it made it look a little, a little second rate to put on, like again, like I said, in between episodes of Cops, and now here's a rerun of Top Gun, and uh, fine programming to be certain, but not something that I would put together with my MMA programming. Um, so it, it's it is it is a big deal in that sense. Uh, I know CBS Sports is in less households, which is notable. So I think we're really going to see the the real test. I think will be not the first few October show, uh, well, excuse me, the first few October shows. The ones in the second half, though, uh, Cyborg. I think Cyborg's coming back on the fifteenth. And then uh, the 29th, I think, is the Lima, Lima and Gegard Musashi yes. fight. Yeah, so those are the two fights that we'll see. I don't want to say necessarily like a boost in, in ratings because they're on CBS Sports, but can they at least kind of hit the the same upper level that they that they were able to on Paramount Network? Because I think some of the shows there at the end of Paramount Network, those ratings were getting were getting rough. Yeah. Uh, th those ratings reports were pretty low, um, except Michael Chandler. I think there was a spike with Michael Chandler, which again uh, shows you kind of his drawing power and why everyone's still, still talking about him right now and so interested in his free agency. But for Bellator, 
the 15th and the 29th is when we're really going to know is the CBS sports move a good thing. Um, it's certainly not a bad thing. It's just, sorry, how good, I should say, how good is the move for them? So, um, yeah, and we, we get CBS Sports up here in Canada, I think. So, no bit, no huge change for us, I, I, don't, I don't think. Yeah. It sounds like there might be a, a I was reading right before uh, I came on here that it sounds like there might be a little movement with the whole Chandler thing as well. But, uh, Lucas, what's your kind of take on the whole CBS deal? Well, I think Alex hit the nail on the head a little bit with Paramount. It did kind of feel like it was the leftover from Spike TV, right? Like Paramount showed up, and I guess they were going to show us old cowboy movies as a part of uh, Cops and all that stuff. And then it's like, oh, and by the way, we still have Bellator. And it's like, what? Um, okay. So it, it didn't feel like they were up to their potential, you know? The, the thing that makes me laugh about the deal is that it always feels like Bellator is so many steps behind the UFC. Like whatever the UFC does, they have to do a crappier version of it. Case in point, UFC moves to ESPN. They got to go to ESPN, uh, CBS Sports. <laughs> Ariel Hawani moves to ESPN. Who do we found out just moved to CBS? Luke Thomas. It feels like they they try to combat what the UFC does by doing their, their own version of that, but it's it, it's interesting. I feel like what I like better is that it's CBS Sports. So they actually know what they're doing with sports. I think they might do stuff with boxing or something like that. So I certainly trust CBS more than I do Paramount because old cowboy movies and Phil Davis, like it doesn't it doesn't really you know go together. So uh, I, I'm interested to see what CBS does, but the fact that they brought in Brian Campbell, well, more Brian Campbell, Luke Thomas, it shows that they're serious about it as well. So I'm very curious. I think it could be a great deal. Anything to make it look uh, better, especially presentation-wise and look more professional. So I'm definitely interested to see what CBS are going to do with this. Yeah. And you even saw like Coker, like you were joking about like the Westerns and stuff too. He even said, he was like, oh, he's like, and I, he's like I still love the show Yellowstone. Like he, <laughs> he, he had to put that in there. But uh, yeah, I, I just think like, you know, kind of going off what you guys said too, I think just one of the biggest things that kind of stood out when they made the announcement was the whole like time delay thing, especially for the, with the international Huge. events too. I, that's big because I mean, if you look at Belter too, that's been a, like, as far as like the, like the, you know, the fans that watch, you know, Belter in the UFC, it, that was one of the big complaints, you know, it was just like, you know, they don't, it, it's like, it's just weird to watch it like with that. And I, I think this opens obviously, like I think Alex said, just, you know, kind of more opportunity, more chance for, um, I, I guess just like having that time being more um, accessible, I think, to the fans is big too. Like maybe it won't be a, as many homes, but I think still it is kind of accessible than more than it was before. Yes, yeah, streamlining is so important. It is amazing how every time there was an international belter card, there's just questions. How do I watch this? Yeah, I, I think you guys, I think putting together posts for like uh, results posts or whatever, whatever posts that you would put the schedule of the show on. I'm sure you guys had internal conversations of, of like, I'm like, do you know, it, it, wait, is this part's on? Okay, wait, so this part of the prelims is on this. And then this part of the prelims on this, but then the main card is airing before the prelims of this show. It's actually two, sh it's actually two Bellator shows combined. And, and it just made no sense. And I was just like, I, every time I would look at those things, I'm like, how, imagine having this, even if I were having this conversation in person with someone, how would I explain this? Like, right. How, right? Like writing it down is confusing enough. And they're like, oh, maybe, you know, but maybe if someone just asked me, I'm like, no, that's not helping. I don't know how I explain this to someone, how this belt or show that just, it's, it's actually two separate shows happening on the same day. There's a main cards happening. So <laughs> whatever streamlining they can do, again, I'm sure there'll be some hiccups. Again, anytime you do international shows, there's, I'm sure, you know, this stuff's going to come up, but anytime you can make it easier for people just to watch your programming that's really big that's really big and like you said no more of this time delay man the time delay thing became such a point of contention i think for a lot of people who who want to like take shots at bellator and, and it's legitimate right it's in today's day and age how can anything be on tape delay right? i'm sure there's reasons for it but again for a fan they don't care about the reasons they just want it they just want it and they want it now yeah and one of those international shows too i think that announcement came on thursday but they're obviously having that uh, the France card, I think that's Belter 248. It's uh, She Congo versus uh, Timothy Johnson, uh, the rematch. But Lucas, I I'll start with you on this one just because I know you know you were recently kind of in France and you saw what's like during the whole quarantine thing. Like, how do you kind of feel about them allowing fans? I think they said like about 5,000 fans. I think it's 25% of whatever the arena holds are allowed to have. Well, I think what people don't realize is that uh, we're, we're not doing social distancing. That's just how many fans actually want to attend the show in France. But it just happens <laughs> that it looks like. <laughs> uh, but listen, obviously, I was in France pretty much during the whole pandemic, except for recently. And if there's one country that I trust that if they say we can allow some fans, France would be that country that I trust. I mean, listen, they kept us quarantined. If you left the house, you needed a signed paper. Listen, I'm going to, you know, the French Walmart or whatever. I'm exercising. And, and if you didn't have that paper... You know, you, you could get arrested and, you know, cops, all that stuff. So they, they took it very seriously, which means that for me, if they're allowing people to go to the show, they, they have plans in place. I don't think you're going to be wearing a mask the whole time, but I assume they're going to socially distance everyone. If France said it was okay, 
then I'm sure they have the right measures in place. Because when I was there, everything was taken very seriously, even going to restaurants, stuff like that. Things were uh, definitely better than America, where I see the people here, it's like they barely cover their mouths and, you know, we're infringing on our rights. But in France, people are pretty good about respecting the measures, you know, buying way too much hand sanitizer. So I'm sure the government has something in place that's going to keep these guys safe. It does seem a little bit risky, but I think soccer, they already started bringing back the fans as well. So I'm sure they're going to do things correctly. I'm not too worried about it, but it does look a little bit weird, especially where in America the situation is not uh, is very different from how it is currently in France. What did you kind of make of the whole thing, uh, Alex? Uh, them having fans? Yes. Again, you know, again, like I said, I'll definitely defer to Lucas here. Like, uh, you know, uh, Japan was kind of doing it, before, I think a few months ago they had a show in – Saitama or Yokohama I'm sorry kickboxing show I think it was a K1 show and this was like this was in like uh end of April like this was so soon after uh the 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 outbreak really started and all these companies were shutting down this just Japan this K1 show I think uh uh start had it fans and they kind of did stuff that people are doing now so again I think they did it too early but I, I understand uh, that from that, that they at least did their best. There were some temperature checks. There was, you know, that okay, a certain amount of seats people are seated here. Doesn't they have seating? So, uh, you know, I think they took a lot of criticism for it. But like, kind of like Lucas says, like maybe these organizations know what they're doing. Maybe these, you know, uh, these these governing bodies know what they're doing. I'm still against it, but I'm also I'm a fairly paranoid person. I'm a better safe than sorry person, and I understand uh, again if people have the proper safety protocol in place that they feel like the show must go on and let's give it a shot and someone has to be the first one through the door so uh if this is how it goes down in france and it goes down safely i mean that's a big step uh, for them and also again for beltor to have pulled this off for sure and, and you know we talked uh, a lot about beltor now but we you know we also had the ufc this past weekend and obviously beltor had the advantage of having those two cards but i mean even though a lot of people kind of were maybe the ufc car wasn't the most highly touted going in i mean i think it uh, it, it served pretty well, and especially with the water stand and, and hill too. I mean, that was a, a, a great fight, you know, all the way through. So for you guys, and we'll start with Alex on this one too, uh, what promotion do you think kind of won the weekend? Was it an advantage having two cards, Connor? Was it? Because based on based on the reception I've seen to 245, I mean, sorry, I watched uh, the highlights 245 and some of the fights in replay, but I did not, uh, did not catch it live. But I was paying attention to social media at the time. And I saw a lot of people not thrilled with the main event, not mm -hmm. super thrilled with Kat Zingano's debut. Uh, and uh, depending who you ask, thrilled or not thrilled with some of the techniques that struck below the equator. <laughs> uh, now, I'm, I'm a sadistic person, uh, and, I, and I, I find humor in fouls in MMA sometimes. I think we all do, right? We all enjoy... Uh, we all enjoy a good low blow every now and then. Uh, but I will say, even I felt sympathy for poor Peter Stanonik, yeah. who I'm sure everyone's seen the clip by now. Of Raymond Daniels striking, I think it was twice, yeah. with spinning kicks to the yeah. groin. Spinning kicks to the groin. We're not talking a glancing, like, teep that accidentally, you know, was a misplaced teep. No, no, no. These were spinning kicks. I think that Raymond Daniels later described as uh, uh, his grenade, a grenade launcher or dynamite. <laughs> Just not, not, he described it in a way that you would not want to be hit by that kind of strike. Yes. <laughs> way ahead. So, uh, that card certainly didn't do Belter favors. Uh, uh, but I thought, I thought from what I saw on Saturday, it was definitely much better. I thought the main event was very, very strong. I thought they got some very positive things that they can build on, like, uh, Neiman Gracie. That's a nice win. That's a nice bounce back win. Oh, sorry, guys. Am I frozen? Um, so we kind of look like a robot right now. <laughs> uh, did we lose him? I think we might have lost him. Ah, oh, there he is. Making a comeback. Alex, can you hear us? Oh, we can't hear him. Well, well, well maybe Alex is, is working on that. Lucas, <laughs> for you, uh, what promotion kind of uh, won the weekend? Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry, my back. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's back. Yep. Hello, hello. Sorry about that. Sorry, Lucas, were you in the middle of a thought? Sorry, I'm having some internet connections here. Uh, sorry, Lucas, were you in the middle of a thought? I, didn't want, I don't want to interrupt you if you were taking over. No, 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 don't try to out Canadian me. Like uh, I gave you the, your space. Your bag. Go, go, go yeah, ahead. sorry. I was saying the uh, yes, even though the the uh, main event and some of the action on two forty five may have been disappointing. I think there was a lot of positives from two forty six. A very good, uh, a very good main event. Uh, a strong champion. I like Juan Archuleta. I know he's not, you know, maybe not the most well known guy now, but you you can you can work with him as your champion. Very talented guy. Neiman Gracie, huge, huge comeback uh, for after from the Rory McDonald loss which I think had a lot of people questioning, you know, oh, was he, you know, like any Bellator guy when they take their first loss, it, was he just defeating easier competition? John Fitch, very legitimate. Yes, maybe near the end of his career. 
or at the very end of his career, as we found out after, but a uh, very tough guy to submit. So that was great for Gracie. And then um, starting to be thing for Liz Carmouche. And, uh, you know, Keone Diggs with a big upset, but that's good. I mean, Derek Campos, an established name, uh, he's the kind of guy you keep around for that, for exciting fights. And, hey, maybe to, as we say in you know, pro wrestling parlance, put over uh, a younger talent. I'm, I'm not saying he meant to, but I, I think a lot to build on. But I'll, I'll give the edge to the UFC. I thought the card surpassed expectations. I know there's a lot of people that were down on it. I, I was a big fan of the main event. And I think, again, top to bottom. You had both entertaining fights. I think there's two or three fights that could have won fight of the night. And again, you had people also step up. Uh, Kevin Kroom, great story. There was a lot of good stories. So I'll, I'll give the edge to the UFC. I think they had they had the better card, uh, taking everything into account. Uh, how about you, Lucas? Well, I think it's tough because, like I said off the top, if Bellator could have combined and created just like one gigantic card, title fight, uh, you know, the co-main event, like it could have been a really good card and I think it would have surpassed the UFC. But instead, we got Friday, a card that looked fun on paper and was not fun at all, <laughs> especially for, uh, you know, with Raymond Daniels. I forgot what his opponent's name was, but anything you hear yeah. a grown man screaming like that, especially someone who's <sighs> punched in the face for a living, like my nuts hurt watching that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be all up in there, but no, it was it was awful hearing that. I mean, listen, we had some names. The Kat Zingano fight, like, listen, I, I was fine with it because she needed to do what she needed to do to win, to bounce back, the big promotion. But, I mean, you know, on paper, it really didn't deliver that much. The The main event wasn't great. Like, I feel like if we could have had one combined card, they would have beat the UFC. But, hmm. uh, like Alex mentioned, just going on Twitter, you can see, like, where the hype is. And I feel like more people were excited for the UFC, more people were talking about the, the main event there than they were anywhere else. Even though Bellator went after the UFC – which was good because they didn't have to compete for it. But I, you have to give the edge to the UFC, even though I feel like Bellator could have and possibly should have won that night with the, the kind of fights they put on. But, you know, I think I think it's a missed opportunity giving us two mediocre cards instead of like one really good card to sort of, you know, rival everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think just just to kind of like piggyback off that too, I, I think I think especially in the circumstances of like going into this card, a lot of people weren't like that excited about this UFC card. There was a lot of, uh, talk about this main event too. Like people didn't didn't think that would, that should be like a main event. So you think like with Bellator too, that could have been uh, maybe something could have capitalized on more too. But one thing I do want to talk about uh, 245 too is everyone's talking about the Sononic, but actually in the uh, prelims there was a heavyweight fight where there was also a, a similar. I mean, it wasn't spinning back kick, but I mean the guy's groans. Like I remember when uh, Sononic first got hit, I was like, oh my god, it's like deja vu. It sounds just like the other guy did. And that guy. I don't, that guy, I don't think got a stretcher out, but he was having a hard time walking, <laughs> at least. But uh, one thing that kind of stood out to me, too, about that card, um, I was covering it for Miami News, so I guess I was watching maybe a little closer than some of the casual people. But, uh, like, I just thought that, you know, with 246, too, I thought that was a better card. But uh, Taylor Johnson, Alex Polizzi, I thought those were two guys that Bellator, um, I mean, I thought those were great, though, because uh, Polizzi got that win over Cavallo, so I think that's a guy that you could – you know, push too. And Johnson got a very impressive win over Ruth too. So I thought there was uh, definitely room to build True. there as what well. Is, what is up with Carvalho? What's the, what, 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 what happened there? He was just, he was just like dominated. Like, I mean, police, just looked, uh, I thought the better all yeah, around. Yeah. He, just, he just looked like he didn't want to be there. Honestly. That's not saying I just mean in general, uh, yeah. four, four, four of his last five losses in four of his last five. Um, he's not that old. He's 34. Uh, he's mile 21 fights. That's, I mean, that's a decent amount of mileage, but that's not extraordinary by MMA means. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I, maybe I got to track this guy down for an interview because yeah, I, I, he really kind of, he's really kind of fallen off a little bit. I mean, I guess Musasi, Machida, Nemkov, there's no shame in losing to those guys, but, uh, yeah, then you lose an up and comer like Polizzi, eh, you know, again, no shame, but four out of five for a former Bellator champion. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. I think especially like that too, because when you talk about those other losses, yeah, you're like, all right, like you know, you can kind of see that. But even like I like Polizzi too, it's just like even though he's undefeated, you still look at those fights and you're like, wow, that's such like a big like experience jump too, though. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't expect him to be that dominant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, again, you know, sometimes you just hit that wall. Who knows? Maybe again, maybe it is just the, the run of a Polizzi's face. Maybe he took. You said he didn't look like he didn't want to be there. Maybe he took Polizzi lightly. Uh, let's hope that's not the case. That's probably the, that's like the worst thing any fighter can do. Um, so. I don't know. Hopefully good things are ahead for Rafael Cavallo, but that, that is a tough stretch he's in right now. Yeah. But I think we all were kind of leaning towards uh, the UFC uh, as far as being the winner this weekend. So let's kind of jump into that, that main event, which, I mean, it, it turned out great, obviously. But I think the big story here is with, you know, the kind of the loser of this fight, Angela Hill. That's her second straight loss. And obviously you could um, argue both. I mean, I think Gadea lost probably more than 
this one, but uh, for you guys too, I, I guess we'll start with Alex again. You know, what, what did Angela Hill's, you know, second straight loss kind of mean for her? I don't, honestly, I don't think it's too terrible. Uh, mm. I don't think it sets her back very far. For one thing, this is the most uh, publicity she's had going into a fight. She had a nice little ESPN featurette. Um, she, she was, you know, she was a star during media day. She's always good during media day, but she was given plenty of time to operate and to talk. So, uh, and that sense it was good for her. And she handled it all really well. I think for someone who, Yes, she's very, you know, out there on social media. She seems very upfront. She also she does strike me as someone who's a little bit uh socially awkward, but but has learned to, you know, has learned to to uh talk to people and to speak to us and deal with us in the media as her as her profession has forced her to do. So I think she's become one of the best interviews, if anything. Um, and she showed that this week. So she had her time in the spotlight. Michelle Watson's kind of been in this role before. Uh, I think this is her third UFC main event. We know she's good with the media, so that wasn't surprising. But I think Angela Hill really, really stepped up and uh, and and stepped up in the fight as well. It was a great fight. I actually did score for Watterson. I had one of the more controversial cards. I actually agreed with Sal Diamato, which did not go over well with the people I mentioned that to. So I probably <laughs> probably should have pretended I didn't say it on the show. But it's out there on Twitter, so I, I own it. Uh, and and when I say I think Michelle Watterson won more rounds, I mean those rounds were super close. You know, you 48, 47 either way. Even for me, like I said, 49, 46. But you could take two of those rounds and really, I don't, I don't want to say it's kind of. It's almost a kind of a coin toss it was such a great competitive fight so in that sense i really don't and the fact that uh so many people thought angela hill won there's certainly enough of an uproar that it almost makes it, it almost helps her you know now she's had hard luck twice in a row i think she's developing that reputation as, a, as as someone who fights so so hard and for some reason it's just not getting that nod from the judges and i think fans get behind someone like that they get behind winners too but they get behind hard luck losers too so uh i don't want to i hate to use the word loser for angela hill because i think she was a big winner on Saturday, regardless. And I don't think we see her uh, drop too far in the rankings. And knowing her again, she'll probably be fighting uh, two weeks from now. So not sure. Not sure she's affected that much by the loss. Yeah. Well, that's what, like the circumstance, I think, is like so kind of like weird too and like unique too. Because like you, you think about someone who you're like, oh, well, they had two straight losses. You'd be like, wow, their stock must have really dropped. It doesn't really feel like Angela Hill's <laughs> stock really dropped that much, especially like you said too. I think she's kind of getting some sympathy from the fans too because they feel for her that, you know, they thought she should have won those fights too. So. I mean, it almost seems like she's kind of uh, maybe even gaining something in, in a sense. But for you, Lucas, you know, where do you kind of stand on it? I mean, you know, it's two split decisions, so it's not like she got gadoosh two fights in a mm -hmm. row. Uh, she does a great job of marketing herself as well, as we've seen on social media. For people like Alex, who I guess have been lucky enough to interview her, they've seen that uh, first things uh, up close. But she does a great job of keeping her name out there, and it seems like the fans haven't turned on her. You know, it's like it makes me think like someone like Israel Adesanya, who – you know, was doing a great job of marketing himself. And then out of nowhere, everybody hated him. It seems like everybody likes Angela Hill. So she's going to be one of those names that, you know, people are going to like her. And even if she loses a close fight, since people like her, they'll probably tend to lean towards her. I'm not saying people in the media because uh, obviously we're in a different position, but she's going to do a good job of keeping her name out there. In terms of what it does, I mean, it's two fights in a row where there's a lot of people that scored it for her. She's going around telling everyone that she won those fights. And some people are believing her in this case. So it's not two fights that are damaging. She's won rounds. It's not like she lost 50, 45, and 30, 27. So it's not going to do a whole lot. I think, if anything, it showed us that she's ready. I mean, Gadelia, you can say what you want about her declining or not, but she's a tough out. Same thing with Michelle Watterson. I think it showed she belongs to the top of the division. And if anything, it should be exciting because she's hanging in with these people. Some people thought she won. So for me, it's not going to be damaging for her at all. And we're seeing her take a ton of fights. So before you know it, she's going to be on a winning streak. We're going to forget about it. So... I'm excited to see her future. I mean, she has a she still has a bright future at this point. Yeah, and, and I think just importantly, the company likes her. You know, when you yeah. mentioned like the media likes her, the fans like her, the company likes her. That's really yeah. what matters the most, right? Forget about us. Uh, yeah. We know they like Michelle Watterson. She's a company woman through and through. Uh, and I think Angela Hill is in that way as well. I mean, maybe not as far as, uh, you know, they kind of butted heads over. I think Angela Hill thinks uh, uh, Michelle Watterson's a bit of a brown noser, uh, something <laughs> to that effect. But, but I think they're both... Uh, uh, well liked by the company in different ways. If anything, just because Angela Hill keeps agreeing to take fights, and that is like that is the one thing they asked for. And the other thing I'll say is, I think Angela Hill did a great job um, having having to speak on the narrative of again the social unrest going on in North America, the Black Lives Matter movement. Because I don't think she volunteered herself for that. I don't think she she didn't shy away from it certainly, but it's not her responsibility to speak for all black athletes or mm -hmm. all black women uh, in that position. But she was asked about it. I think she did a great job speaking about it. Um, people can like her answers or not. Can, people can like her, her attitude towards it or not. That's fine. But I think she handled it as best she could. And I think, I think that's another, another feather in her cap coming out of this weekend that shows she can tackle a really, uh, a really difficult controversial subject heading into a, a very, very big fight for her and still perform well. And it's just unfortunate she didn't get the nod, but otherwise, 
I, I just came out on top in so many ways. Yeah, it feels like there's so many like storylines like around Hill too, because I mean, not even all that, but I mean, she's also one of the more active fighters too. So that's always something that, you know, people can obviously, uh, you know, jump onto a, as well. And like, I have to think too, that she's already kind of pushing for that Gade if I know Gade, if uh, Gade has got a fight in, in November, but mm. that's one that I think eventually they're, they're going to have to probably run back there. Yeah, she, I think she'd get the winner or loser of that fight. It's either Gadelia. And I think she's, she's fighting uh, Yan Shaonan, I think. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yep. I think I would have no problem with Hill to, again, either getting the winner of that fight or the loser. I think it, it makes sense. Again, she's in that spot. Uh, the other things I thought for her were maybe, maybe she fights another veteran, maybe like a, a Felice Herrig. Oh, sorry. Well, not Felice Herrig. Now I know Felice Herrig's dealing with some injuries. Uh, sorry. I was going to say a rematch with Tisha Torres. That could be, that could happen. Okay. I think, I think she fought Tisha in her first or second actual UFC fight. I don't remember. And then uh, that was quite a, a long time ago. I could see that happening. And then uh, wherever Karolina Kovalkovich is, that fight is a possibility as well. Um, another fighter who's kind of on a losing streak, uh, a little more definitive than Angela Hills, but uh, someone who, again, would make for a good fight. And again, you two people with experience you can put in, the, in a co-main event or, or uh, whatever whatever situation you want to put them in. So yeah, she doesn't fall far. I, I hope they don't relegate to the status of gatekeeper, but considering how frequently she wants to fight, I don't think she cares. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, that's it for, for the topics this week. And, uh, but, but, you know, before we kind of close it here, uh, Alex, uh, anything you'd like to add and also anything that maybe you're looking forward to uh, this upcoming uh, weekend? Oh, sorry, can you repeat that? My, I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone for my connection. It keeps uh, keeps conking in. Uh, sorry, okay. can you repeat that? No, yeah. I was just, uh, you know, b- before we kind of get going here, uh, for you, uh, anything you're kind of looking forward to as far as, you know, fights this weekend, uh, any, any particulars? Did we lose him again? <laughs> Man, uh, you know, again, I think that's for everybody else. It's it might be a little uh, past its best before date. Oh, hold on. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> God, we're gonna think- finish strong. We're gonna get through this. We got it, Alex. <laughs> we're with you. Can you hear Ask us? Lucas first. Ask Lucas first. All right, <laughs> Lucas. <laughs> what are you looking forward to uh, uh, this upcoming weekend? Anything? Can you go to Lucas uh, first. Obviously, that that main event, Colby Covington versus Tyron Woodley, I think I'm taking Alex's point a little bit. Uh, You know, the question is, how much does uh, Woodley have in the tank? But listen, it's still a fun grudge match. It wasn't marketed well at all, if you can call it being marketed, but it's still a fun fight. I saw a bunch of people talking about the card, like, you know, this could be a a pay-per-view or something like that. So no, it's it's a stacked card. I think I might even have a friend come over and uh, watch it. And and it's not a pay-per-view, so that tells you, you know, how good the card is. So very excited for the main event. I'm afraid we're all going to get our hearts broken because it's going to be a a replay of the Lawler Covington fight. He said we replaced Lawler with Woodley. You know, that's what my my head says, what my heart says no. So uh but no, it's it's a stacked card. I'm really looking forward to all of it. And uh yeah, it, it should be a, a very good weekend of fights. And if it doesn't deliver, I'm gonna be very disappointed. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. And I, I'm also that that co main event too between uh Price <laughs> and Cerrone too. I, I'm looking for that. And also too, I mean the just the uh the poster that Price uh posted on too on Twitter, that was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, Alex, uh, where, where do you kind of stand on the whole thing uh, with this upcoming weekend? Anything you're looking forward to? Guys, I, like I said, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm obligated to talk about him. Uh, ah, right, right, right. I, uh, sorry, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Darn it. Am I back? Am I back? Am I back? Holy uh, we can hear your voice. What's going on. We got can't, radio, we can't I've got radio waves <laughs> passing through my neighborhood. Um, hello, hello. Yeah. Can you hear us? Okay, don't worry about seeing me. If you can hear my voice. Yep. Hamzat Shemaev. We have to talk about it. I, I'm <laughs> I'm on I'm of two minds of this guy. I'm like a lot of people. I love what I saw on Fight Island. Okay. Super exciting. Love his personality. I want to smash. I want to fight two times in one night. That's great. UFC loves it. I want people to temper their expectations. <laughs> he's he's uh, eight and oh now, nine and oh. He's facing a guy in Mearshart, very strong grappler, bigger than a guy who I think will be bigger than him when they get in the cage. I could be wrong. Uh, and, uh, and look, I, I think, I, of course, I'm picking Shamayev. That's fine. But I want people to temper their t- The first two guys he beat have zero grappling game. Zero. And 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 he and he did what he's supposed to do. He took care of business. Okay, I am not trying to 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 slow down the Shamayev hype train. If you love Hamzat Shamayev, more power to you. I'm just saying, I wouldn't be surprised if he lost to Gerald Mearshart. I wouldn't be surprised if he lost to Damian Maya. Okay, I, these are the, and there's no shame in it. These are guys are veterans of the sport. I, I'll pick, I'll gladly pick Shamaya for both fights, but for me, 
and I think a lot of people, uh, besides the main event, maybe even some people, including the main event, given like we kind of mentioned, it's it, we wish we'd gotten this fight like two years ago, the the, the Covington Woodley fight. This Shamaya fight might be the most like intriguing fight for a lot of people, uh, just based on how much heat he had coming off Fight Island. I don't know. I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm just I'm just guessing, but um, that for me is definitely one to look out for, and I'm sure a lot of people as well. No, I, I totally agree with that, too, because I remember I think it was on one of our shows, Lucas, we kind of talked about who were kind of the biggest winners from that whole Fight Island series. And, I mean, he was easily one of the front runners, uh, you know, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's exciting. But like, like you mentioned, the expectations, right? Because people are like, oh, you ragged all two Cage Warriors guys that can't wrestle. So now you've got two dudes that can wrestle. So it's going to be a, the interesting test to find that out. Yeah, and hey. Before- it, credit to the UFC. Like I said, I wouldn't. I thought this, I think this matchmaking is insane. But they're all. They, they said they're all in, and they're certain the matchmaking certainly makes it look like they're all in. So let's see. Let's see what happens there. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Alex, before I let you go, too, uh, we do have a, a, a listener question here that I, I want. Oh, to do not ask read this you. out. Do not read this out. I just look. I just saw. Do not read. It. I'm not falling for this trap. I can see the questions too. I'm, not, right. falling. Right. I'm not falling for this trap. <laughs> sounds good and uh all right guys well alex thanks so much for giving the time uh i really appreciate it i know Lucas I apologize does as well. for the connection it's okay right. blame canada <laughs> blame canada as they say uh, i apologize for the connection all right all right guys well thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys next week with another great guest enjoy the fights this weekend and uh take care